Hi guys, this is uh, Terry with Futures IO. It is my honor to welcome back Peter Davies for today's webinar on getting started in scalping. If you have questions, you can type them into the box, questions box. We'll do our best to answer them at the end of the event. If you're watching this on YouTube, please do us a favor and give us a thumbs up if you enjoy the webinar. Also, please feel free to share, comment, subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot. Don't forget that you can also follow us on Twitter at Futures IO. I would like to direct your attention to our current webinar schedule. You can view this schedule on our homepage at www.futures.io. Without further delay, I'll hand it over to Peter. Okay, thank you, Terry. I'm just waiting for control here so I can share my screen. So do you want to hand out? Okay, let me just uh, share my screen. Can I just get a Y in uh, the chat if you can all hear me okay? Yeah, they're posting in the questions, yes. Okay, good, good, good. Right, scalping. Let's just, uh, before we start, let's look at the disclaimer. We've all seen this disclaimer before. Just one thing I'd like to add, which uh, isn't in the mandatory disclaimer, about uh, risk. Whenever somebody talks about trading, they're always talking about it from their own uh, attitude or appetite for risk, and this webinar is no different. So just bear in mind that when you know I tell you, about techniques, it's about it's, it's it's really from my perspective and my risk appetite. And you've got to, whenever you uh, try and uh, look at techniques, take them away. Uh, you've always got to adapt them, not just to your own personality, but also to your own risk profile and your own account size. So please just bear that in mind. So today we're going to talk about scalping. So before we talk about some of the techniques that we're going to look at, we first have to talk about what scalping is, because originally. Scalping was a term used to define trading that pretty much just captured the spread, so buying the bid and selling the offer. Now over time the term has become more widely used and now people use it to describe many different styles of trading and I guess the reality is that the word scalping doesn't really mean much anymore. It's become overused and now it's really more a matter of opinion of what defines a scalp and what doesn't. But in this presentation I'm going to stick to trading techniques that are closer to the original definition of scalping, starting out with techniques that focus on capturing the spread. And these are techniques, these aren't just because this is the uh, original definition of scalping, we are talking about techniques that are valid today. Now we will of course talk about techniques that capture more than one tick because even a market maker looking to capture the spread will take more if it's on the table. So when we think about scalpers, it's not as if scalpers are actually intentionally leaving money on the table by just taking one tick from a trade. It's just that scalpers are working from a completely different perspective. So today's webinar is to some extent more about that perspective, the, the decision-making process, than the amount of ticks, profit or loss. And the perspectives really are different. So a longer term day trader might be, might be looking at support and resistance, trying to figure out what sort of day type it is, you know, what the MACD is doing, where the value area was yesterday and so on. Um, but scalpers, certainly those in their purest spread, spread capturing form, simply do not care about any of that stuff. So with a different perspective, they make decisions based on different factors and those factors are often very short lived and can change minute to minute. Now, not only are perspectives different, but so are the win rates. In fact, the win rate of a scalper is often what many traders would consider to be outrageously high. So I can tell you, I actually know a scalper whose stats are 85% wins, 10% scratches, and 5% losses. Now, of course, these stats don't include one thing that's a very big part of scalping and that's bids and offers that get placed but where you never get filled because the market leaves without you. Now obviously if you came across a website promising you an 85% win rate you would most likely think that was a scam and in all probability you would be absolutely correct but we're not talking about risking five ticks to make 20 ticks here. We're talking about very small targets and trades where there's a momentary high probability opportunity which is very short-lived. So we can look at trades 
potentially a lot of the times it lasts less than 10 seconds. Now if you consider typical retail commissions on the S&P 500 of $4 a turn, then losing a single tick trade is going to cost you $16.50, but winning a trade would get you $8.50. So of course the win rate has to be higher. It just wouldn't work otherwise. And it also makes sense that you use uh, a deep discount broker and also get onto some sort of program with a CME, such as the IIP program that knocks roughly 66 cents off the CME fees for the ES. Now the higher win rate doesn't make scalping better and it doesn't make scalping smart traders. It just means that scalping is different. Okay, So it's a different uh, perspective and a different set of win rates. So the goal today is to give you some insights into what scalpers do, how they make decisions, and we'll start off at the smallest target trades, and as we go through, we'll look at those trades where we can get more ticks. And then the question is, why scalp at all? So why is it the prop firms start their interns off as scalpers? Well, the most significant reason to me is the learning curve. So first of all, let's consider techniques that fit the typical goal of most retail traders. So those that get into trade, you can sit in for like 50 ticks on crude oil or 8 points on the S&P futures. And the most popular techniques right now seem to be market profiling and volume profiling techniques. And these are methods of attempting to determine how the day might play out and where the extremes of the day might be. In other words, you're trying to guess where the market will go that day. So let's say you read Jim Dalton's books on market profile. There's a lot of stuff in there to absorb. So let's say you read the first book in a week. That would be a lot to keep in your head when you actually opened your trading platform the next trading day and attempted to apply it. And there's two aspects to applying those techniques. So one is actually learning it bit by bit and applying it so that you actually retain the knowledge because nobody can really read a book in a week and then execute and, and, and retain all the knowledge in that book. And the other is experiencing the different day types so you're actually able to come up with suitable scenarios before a day starts because it's not that hard to look at past market activity long term, you know, look at what's happened over the past few weeks and then the past few days and come up with some tradable scenarios for the day. But you do have to do it repeatedly to get good at it. And the problem, if we can call it a problem, is that you can only plan scenarios and see how that day actually unfolded one day at a time. So it's the same for other techniques such as volume profiling. You might see someone come up with a, a few scenarios each day and see that person's quite consistent in having some of those scenarios play out. But that's more of a reflection of their experience than their theoretical knowledge. So they've experienced a lot of days. So let's say every day you decided to write down potential scenarios. How long would it take before you started to get good enough to plot out tradable scenarios with some consistency? Well, it's obviously going to be many months because you need to do it across different market conditions. So six months to a year is by no means an extreme estimate considering you just get one shot per day. Which brings us to one of the main benefits of scalping and the reason it's the starting place for most prop futures traders. So instead of plotting out one scenario a day, you're plotting out scenarios over and over throughout the day. And at extremes, this could be in the hundreds, but at lower frequencies, you'd still like to be looking at 20 to 30 tradable scenarios a day. So in essence, scalping is a skill you develop over a shorter time period because you're experiencing more scenarios and more trades each day. Now, you still have all the same demons to exercise though. So if you can't exit a losing, losing trade, you're still going to have to overcome that issue. But the bottom line is you can get profitable scalping while you're still focused on your longer term day game. And that is effective. When I talk to prop traders, that is effective what they end up doing. So there's no need to throw away the Jim Dalton books, uh, forget about longer term trading skills. Those skills are still of value. It's just going to take you a longer time to get to profit. And then, of course, there is the comfort zone. So with scalping, you are in and out of the market very quickly. And many people are simply more comfortable 
with less time in individual trades. So this sort of trading is simply going to suit more people than others. Now the other thing about scalping is it's something that every trader should learn about because one of the things about scalping, very often it's a scalper that's on the other side of your trade and it's always good to know what other participants are doing. Now no discussion on scalping would be complete without thinking about the tick values of the instruments you trade. So let's have a quick look. Uh, here's the US Treasury futures on CBOT. CBOT sorry. We can see that the five-year Treasury note has the lowest tick value, just under $8 a tick. The Treasury bond and the Ultra Treasury bond are the highest tick values with $31.25 per tick. Now obviously this makes a huge difference to the impact commissions have on your trades. So you can get retail commissions on these instruments of around $2.60 per round turn, which is effectively 30% of the tick size of the five-year Treasury note, but less than 10% of the tick size of the Treasury bond and Ultra Treasury bond futures. So if you're trading for a tick or two, it makes more sense to work on higher tick value markets. Now there are some people that will say, no, what you should do, it's too dangerous to start on this tick size. You should start on something with a $5 tick size. And that's effectively making the presumption that you're going to lose, which is really a different matter. And we'll talk about using demo accounts a little bit later on. But basically, if you stick with the higher tick value markets, you can afford to be wrong more often. And being wrong often means you basically get out of a trade at break even, just paying the, paying the commissions. Now, of course, as we discuss scalps with larger targets later on, this does become less of an issue, but it makes a lot of sense to look at markets with larger tick values. So let's have a look at the markets themselves. Now, bear in mind, this is actually taken at 4 a.m. Eastern time, but there are a lot of Asian, European traders trading in these markets at those times. You can see there's a decent amount of liquidity on those markets. So from left to right, we've got the five-year note at 7.25 a tick. We've got the two-year note at 15.63, roughly a tick. And then we've got the Ultra T bond at 31.25 and the Treasury bond at 31.25 as well. Now, not only are the tick sizes different, the volatility is different too. So at one extreme, we have the two-year, very low volatility market with thousands of contracts per level on the bids and offers. So if you put a bid or an offer in this market, um, you may well end up waiting uh, 45 minutes for a fill. Just give me one second. There you go. So obviously, the more liquidity there is in the market, the less volatile it is. So when we look at the two markets on the left, we can see the five-year note has much less liquidity, fewer bids and offers, and a larger range than the two-year note. Now, depending on the techniques you use for scalping, you're going to find that it makes one market more or less attractive. So on the one hand, you're going to have more trade setups per day on a volatile market. On the other hand, you can trade more size on a thicker market. Now, it really comes down to your style or your preference, which type of market you choose. Now, if you consider the two on the right, they've actually got the same tick size of 31.25, but the ultra treasury bond on the left here is slightly less liquid and more volatile than the treasury bond. So my personal preference would be the ultra treasury bond. So your chosen market initially, and I would advise if you're going to start out in scalping, is you stick to one market. It's going to come down to a mix of attractive fee structure, a volatility profile you're comfortable with, and the availability of fairly reliable correlated markets. Now, being in the position I'm at Jigsaw, I do get to speak to a lot of traders, and many of those people are professional traders. And one of the things I've yet to see is a professional futures day trader that only looks at a single market. Now, there is a bit of confusion about this because some people think that looking at multiple markets means somehow being able to read everything that is going on with every one of them. And that is not the case. So let's just have a look at what we mean, what kind of things we're going to look at when we look at correlated markets. So here we can see four depth of markets. And a lot of people will look at this and they're going to run screaming from the room because of all the numbers they see on there. For some reason, people don't like numbers when they trade. But forget for a minute that we've even got numbers on there. So let's just look at the black line. That's the center line. And with most 
decent domes, you can recenter the dome at any time, and the black line effectively becomes a reference point that you can easily eyeball at a glance. So if you glance at this, without looking at a single number, you can see that all markets are trading above their center line. Okay? You can see that the, the thinner markets are leading a little, which should be pretty much what you'd expect because they are more volatile. And at just a glance, we can see that we have upside momentum on all four markets. Now, we didn't actually have to read a single number to see that. So we're not talking about watching every tick of every market. Now, we know there are relationships between markets. We know that arbitrage traders, many of them now HFTs, are stepping in when markets get out of line. We also know markets can speed up and slow down. So when we look at correlated markets, we are primarily looking for the level of overall activity. So are the markets directional or are they simply doing their own thing? So for example, you will see days on the US indices where the Dow is moving up, the Nasdaq's moving down, and on those days, the S&P 500 tends to be slow and range bound. There's no uh, directional conviction in the market and it's not so much that the correlation has actually broken down as much as there's just no interest and basically the market is just kind of moving up and down on their own, feeling their, feeling their way around. And then you'll see times, like in this image, where the market becomes more directional and we can see clear momentum on all of them. So it gives you a gauge of both direction but also about commitment and to an extent that the amount of excitement and overall direction there is in the market. And in addition, it does help to get you into what we call value-based trades. Now, generally speaking, we value things relatively, okay? Not just in the markets, but generally speaking in real life. So if you're going to buy a house, you would look at the recent sale price of similar houses in that area and try and figure out what the house you're trying to buy is worth. If you're trying to buy a second-hand car, you'd compare that with the price of other similar cars that are for sale. And similarly, if you have correlated markets and one has gone up but the other one hasn't, then potentially, for just that moment in time, your market could be considered undervalued. Now, obviously, you could argue that maybe the other market that went up is actually overvalued, but then let's just agree for now that there's a value discrepancy. And if you can get on the right side of that, you should be able to scalp out a tick or two. Then it could be just a few minutes later that opportunity is closed. You either took the trade or you didn't. You might have tried to take the trade, didn't get filled. Market moved on. Now you're looking for the next opportunity. Now, some of the more experienced prop traders trade a dance between interest rates, commodities, energies, index futures. And they can do that because they're so experienced and understand how the markets impact each other. Now, not everybody is going to be able to get to that point, but it does highlight the value of understanding market relationships and how these markets all impact each other. Now, of course, correlations do break down. And correlations can be inverse relationships too, where one market moving up sees another market moving down. And it's absolutely fine to use inverse correlations in scalping. Makes no difference whether you're looking at an inverse correlation or a regular correlation. Um, looking for one market moving up and the other markets for moving down, um, or again, just a lack of excitement, lack of activity overall. Now, the first technique we're going to look at is actually the one I know least about, and we're going to call it the crocodile because it requires the appearance of being asleep for hours until something interesting comes by. Now, I came across this technique uh, a few years ago when I met a group of prop traders for coffee in Singapore, and the firm that they're working at uh, it's a great firm, very flexible. Traders are trading a wide range of different instruments. Some are trading outright positions. Some are trading spreads. Some of them even trading U.S. markets into the night. This prop shop was actually open 24 hours a day. The one girl in the group where we were having coffee was actually trading this technique we call the crocodile. Now, when she explained what she did, I was kind of shocked. My jaw dropped. And the first thought into my head was, well, how on earth would you stay awake actually doing what she's doing. And we've already discussed that scalpers' perspectives are quite different. And that's exactly the reason 
I wanted to look at this first because this is so different from what most people consider trading. It's the perfect introductory technique for this webinar. So here we are on the two year. We're in a slow, ultra thick market and it's 4 a.m. Eastern time. We've got an offering for 10 contracts and we are number uh, 1700 in the queue. So what exactly is going on here? Well, simply put, what we're doing is playing the queue position. We're keeping an eye on our place in the queue and as we get nearer to the queue, we want to see plenty of people behind us and at some point when we think we have a chance of a, a, a fill, we're going to either cancel the trade or we're going to leave it there and let it fill. And the idea is to get into a position with lots of liquidity to be behind you and if you can do that, you can cancel your offer if it gets a bit thin behind you or if you do get into the trade, you've got plenty of time to get out of break even if the correlated markets start moving against you. Now, of course, we may have the presumption that the queue here is a bit like a queue in a supermarket where it's first in, first out, but that's not always the case. And whilst it's a bit beyond the scope of this webinar to cover all the matching algorithms, I'm going to put a link at the end to a video that explains how these matching algorithms work. So, for example, a 10-year treasury note gives priority to the largest limit order first, up to a maximum of 250 contracts. So, even if you're the last person to place a bid, if your bid is the biggest, say a 1,000 contracts, when a market order comes in, you'll get filled first up to 250 contracts from that order. Now the CME, as we know, is changing the way we get queue information. So instead of just seeing how many limit orders, we're going to be able to see not an estimate of our queue position, but our exact queue position, as well as the breakdown of all the limit orders in the queue. So as we all get access to that information through our data providers, people will be able to game the queue. In fact, there's, there's no doubt people are already doing it. But anyway, the queue isn't always first in, first out. So obviously, this style of trading requires a thick market and an understanding of how allocation works on that market. Now, to me, this seems like the most tedious way to trade. But nobody said trading was supposed to be exciting. This is just a way to make money. So two-year treasury and the bubble on Eurex are about the same in terms of liquidity. So there's a couple of markets you could potentially play this game on all day given an understanding of the matching algorithms for those markets. Now, unlike the methods we'll look at next, I'm going to guess that nobody watching this presentation will go away and look into this one. But it does set the scene for understanding the kind of paradigm shift required when it comes to scalping. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I prefer a thinner market. Now, mostly, that's because I actually have a fairly short attention span. Now, we'll look at thicker markets in a second. So what we've got here is the US Treasuries, and we can see, if we look at the center line, the US Treasuries are mostly moving up. Now, the reason for showing this particular trade is fairly simple. If you were a position day trader, this would actually be a terrible place to go long. So if you look at the chart on the top left, you can see we're actually coming back to the day's high for a second time. So it's basically a double top on the ultra bond. But the thing is, as a scalper, you do not care about that. So on a market like this, we're going to be in and out of the market in less than a minute, sometimes less than 10 seconds. So the bottom line is that right now, right here, momentum is to the upside. And there is no evidence at all that people are coming in to play a reversal or a breakout. And in fact, there's no evidence at all that there's any exceptional volume coming into the market. So right now, the scalp trade, because of the upside momentum, is to buy the bid and try to flip out at the offer if we get filled at the bid. So this is kind of basic market making. Now, the trade numbers in the middle of these domes, these are the, the amount we've actually traded at, at each level. That's recently been reset, and we've very recently recentered these domes. So that's why it just looks like the market's just pushed up a couple of ticks. But we can see anyway that the market's marching up. Now, at this point, I have to say, if you simply start bidding every move up, you will definitely lose money. 
So you can't expect to start doing this tomorrow and start earning ticks. But on the other hand, if you started doing this tomorrow, you should not be losing a ton of trades either if you keep trading with the market. Okay, but you probably won't overcome the commissions until you start to understand really how the market you want to trade moves at this level. So that means understanding what state the market is in. Is it starting to show signs it's slowing down or speeding up? Because if it slows down, you apply different techniques to when it's speeding up. Now you can't watch a market for just five minutes and get a good feel for whether it's fast or slow at that point in time. You can watch a market for five days and start to get a feel for the changes in pace though. And the same thing could be said for the related markets and how they tend to move together. So you need to tune in to how these markets move together. And that is the only way you'll get to know if something's exceptional happening and we've got a potential changing direction going on or if the market's just kind of got momentum and just churning up. So once you've chosen your market to trade, and found good correlated markets to watch, you'll have to spend time watching them to make sure those relationships are reliable or if they tend to break down um, or what happens when they gather in momentum or revert to range bound, range bound behavior. So you need to kind of gain some experience. Now you can be practicing while you gain that experience, but you shouldn't be trading live if you're doing that. Now this is a thinner market. We've actually got six bid which is good and bad. It's good because I'm basically at the front of the queue at this point or close enough and it's bad because there's not much behind me but what this picture doesn't show is the actually reason for entry or one of the reasons for entry and that was the attempts this market made to tick down that couldn't hold. So what happened here and the reason the bids are so low is they kept pulling the bids at 07, the market would tick down and then immediately it would tick back up. So it ticked down for less than a second before somebody would jump in and nudge it back up. So it looked like basically they were trying to entice people to sell, trying to make the market look weak. So not many contracts were trading as this was happening. It was all just bids pulling and then people jumping in. So effectively what I've done here, I can see the upside momentum, I can see the bids keep pulling and jumping in. So I waited for the bids to pull and then the moment it ticks up again to 07, I just put in a bid at 07, figuring I'd be close enough to the front of the queue to pretty much have a good chance of being one of the first people filled. So here I am bidding a market um, with a good queue position. It's close to the high. All markets are at their highs with no sign of weakness. We can see momentum to the upside. So at that point, I could cancel my trade. So if I start to see the other markets moving down, I can cancel the trade. Um, if I see sellers in other markets, or um, I can just leave it there, um, get a fill. Uh, once I'm filled, if I see weakness in other markets, I can actually scratch the trade. So what happens? We get a fill. We've got three contracts, 31.25 a tick. Now at this point, I'm not actually that bothered about the target. Okay. All I'm doing is watching the other markets, and of course the market I'm trading to see if there's any sign of weakness and if there is I'm going to scratch the trade. So the only action I am going to take at this point of time is to scratch the trade. Okay? The target's going to take care of itself. Okay? So what we can see now is we can see that since we got in um, we've got 101 contracts have been added to the bid below us. We can see um, 13 contracts have been added to our bid, pretty insignificant to that. Uh, 89 contracts have been pulled from the offers above, so that's a good a good indication that the order flow is on our side. Um, in terms of actual trades, I've got this set to reset uh, the trade columns when you actually enter a trade or get a new position on. So we can see that since I entered the trade, not actually been a lot of trading either way. Now, if we stood there for 30 seconds without a lot of trading either way, I would actually exit that trade. Okay, so there is a time element to this too. Now the question a lot of you are going to be asking is, where's the stop loss? And the answer is, well, I haven't got one. Now that doesn't mean I'm going to let this trade move against me 20 ticks and kind of cross my fingers that it's going to come back. And it also doesn't mean I've got some kind of crazy 10 to 1 risk reward ratio to try to improve my win rate. It simply means that I'm not going to exit the position as a knee-jerk reaction 
to the market ticking down a tick. I'm going to attempt to work an exit. So let's say the bid's broke and we tick down and the bid was now 06. What we can see there right now, there are 157 contracts bid. And if we tick down, obviously the offer would be 07, which is my entry price. Now, if everything else looks stable, I could try to offer 07 and try and get a break even. But if the other market started to push up, I might just sit on my hands um, and just wait for the market to tick, tick back up and just leave my target at 08, which is kind of another paradigm shift for this sort of trading. So we already said this is all about learning how your chosen markets move together. So we have a slightly more volatile market here. Plus, I've just seen them, they keep pulling the bids at 07 and ticking down and then pushing back up. I can't really expect that I've got filled the last time they're trying that. <clears throat> so we know it's going to wiggle about a bit potentially. So instead of panicking if the market moves a tick against us, we're going to keep a cool head. Put that one tick down into perspective, you know, are the correlated markets still bullish? Um, and should we work out at a tick loss? Or are we quite confident that the behavior we're seeing doesn't really indicate a move down? Because after all, we're getting in based on our read of the market and our experience, and we should use that same read and experience to manage the trades. Now, of course, it would make sense to have an emergency stop somewhere you know, maybe four or five ticks below the market. That's sensible, but it's not something that you have to do. And most of the people I know that are scalp don't do that. Anyway, the bottom line is that with 157 contracts at the next price down, I don't want to exit the trade because one contract trades there because that's what a stop loss at that level is going to do to me. So if you know your market well and how it interacts with the markets, you shouldn't go into panic mode if it ticks down against you. Now, as it turns out, we did uh, get our fill. Um, we got just under $90 for what was basically a 20-second trade. Now, one other thing worth mentioning is when do we actually put the target on? Should we use something like a, a ninja trader ATM strategy to put the target on? Well, remember, we're trying to get into the market when the, ads, the odds sorry, are very high that it's going to tick up where there's little evidence the market's getting weaker, but we don't necessarily want to have the target placed automatically when we get a fill. So it's possible that while you're waiting to get your fill, that the correlated markets start to pop, and start to pop quite significantly. So in that case, you might want to wait a short while after the fill to give your market chance to follow that pop. So even if you're just generally trying to catch the spread, there's going to be times where you're going to get more than that. So I've said, you know, just because scalpers are trying to capture the spread and it's mostly one tick trades, they're not leaving money on the table on purpose. Now again, you'll only be able to do that if you're experiencing your market and how your markets work together. So if you feel there's more volatility there in that moment and it's on your side, then by all means put in a wider target. So just like the way we handle stops, you're going to make an assessment of how the markets are moving and you use that to make adjustments as necessary. You know, most likely, you would start off with a one tick target 100% of the time and then over time, experience is going to tell you that sometimes there's going to be more on the table. And by the way, the, the one tick thing isn't a hard rule. So you're going to find like markets like DAX and crude that these opportunities are obviously giving you more than one tick. And certainly for crude, it's hard to see how you could profit from a one tick trade given the tick value and the commissions. Now the bottom line is that you just don't care about predicting where the market is going, uh, when it's going to turn, when a pullback will end. All you're doing is looking at right here, right now, in this moment, what is going on and playing that as long as you don't see any risk. So you might be long now and out of that trade in 10 seconds, 30 seconds later, you might decide that the opportunity is the short side. And with this trade, we're already way out of many traders' comfort zones. So from buying at the high to not using a hard stop. So like we said, this is a very different type of trading, making decisions in a much smaller time frame. So let's move on to a thicker market and also some inverse correlations. So we're looking at Eurex. The leftmost market here is the bobble. Then we have the Bund. Both of those are interest rate products. 
Then we've got the Euro stocks 50 and we've got the DAX on the far right. Now as a rule, we generally see an inverse relationship between interest rates and stocks, although we know that can break down for extended periods and we're going to leave the reasons for that beyond the scope of this webinar. Now what we're seeing now though is interest rates pushing up and the stock futures pushing down. And we can see quite clearly that size is hitting into the bids here on the way down on the stocks and we can see the size is hitting into the offers on the way up on the ball and, and the bobble. On the DAX, it's a correlated market, it's a good market to use, but it's so thin, it's kind of hard to determine, you know, really any, any, any imbalance in the size on each side, but it definitely helps you with direction. So we've got clear downside momentum on stocks at this moment in time, and that's supported by correlated markets. Now, we can also see the bidders pulling out of the way on the stocks, and we can also see I've attempted to join the offer at 29.38 uh, and it's gone past me. So at this point, I'm offering 29.37 and I'm about to cancel the offer at 29.38. So basically, I know I've, I've missed this one. I'm more concerned with getting into a trade than worrying about getting filled on two trades. I don't see uh, a very high probability of getting filled on both. So basically, I put my new order in before I cancel the old one. So to me, thicker markets are a bit more of a pain because a lot of the time, you're going to be right, but you're not going to get the fill. Now, you can't chase a market down forever, but as long as you know the market well and how it behaves alongside its peers, you can make an educated decision on when to carry on bidding it and, and when it's really too late. Now, this is the same deal as the last trade. You know, we got in, got a fill, but this time, obviously, we've got a little bit more time to make a decision. So, we can see above us there's 431 offers in the, the, the offer above. We can see 1,027 above that. So if we tick up, we do have some liquidity we have to clear uh, before we really move away from our trade. Uh, we can see the bids below us are pulling out of the way. And to some extent, you know, the offers are firming up a little. Now, the interest rates at this point in time aren't coming down, which is good. DAX has moved up a bit, but again, it is the DAX, so it's so volatile, it tends to be all over the place. So again, what we're doing is we wait to scratch the trade or take a tick. Now, in terms of the tick size, it's 10 euros a tick. So again, this is not an attractive, as attractive a market to trade as the US ultra treasury bonds. Anyway, so we get the fill. Less than a minute has passed since we placed our offer, got filled, put in our bid and got out of the trade. So the market actually hasn't ticked down. It's still where it was when we got in, but enough contracts have traded that we got to the front of the queue and we got our fill. So we, we had our bid at 36, we got filled at 36, and we are still trading at 36. In effect, we've traded a non-move. The market is still where it was when we got into the trade. So that covers three different perspectives on capturing the spread, which by nature, it's a higher cost, higher win rate activity. Now the main considerations are fee versus tick value, and whether you're suited personally to a fast or a slow market. Then, it's about learning your market so you know when it's acting normal, and you know when it's acting normal, that's when you can actually get the spread. Uh, you know when there's clear momentum, you know when it's slow and range bound and you don't panic if it moves against you a little. So this isn't something you would trade ahead of a news release, right? It's a trade for certain market conditions in your chosen market. Now perhaps the most dangerous trend in trading education right now is the amount of people telling you to front run large orders. In other words, telling you that if you see a large bid or offer, you just put an order in front of that and you'll make money from it. And this is a really appealing concept because it's basically a one-line set of trading rules. But it's rather silly because it ignores the fact that a lot of the time these large orders are placed in the market to make you front run them so that they can then run you over by trading against you. In other words, the large orders are simply other traders trying to fool you. So it would be fantastic if trading was that simple, to simply sit at the trading screen wait for a large bid or offer to appear, and then put a trade in front of it. No long-term analysis, no need for context, 
Just wait for the Magic Meter offer and then press the button to trade. Still, front running is a valid technique that you can apply in some scenarios. And so like all trading, it's nuanced. And of course, when you tip the scales in your favor, it's still not going to work every trade. But the great part about front running is that you have a very clear exit point. After all, if you sell in front of a large offer and it goes up past that large offer a few ticks, you're wrong, okay? But it's not a magic signal, nor is it some kind of shortcut people make it out to be. So here we've got crude oil. We can see a large order here for 531 contracts at 43.20. Ahead of that, we don't actually see much. Okay, we've got 19 contracts, 24 contracts, 27 contracts. Same thing below, 19, 23, 19. Not much below it at all. Now we can see the same thing on the heat map too. Not only is this level massive relative to all other levels, if you look at the time at the bottom, you can see it's been there for almost 10 minutes. So it's not a new order that's just popped up. Now some people will tell you older orders are more reliable. So let's just see how reliable this one was. Now as we approach the level, we can see orders are still there, but all on their own. Oh, I'm sorry. And we can also see that ahead of that level and behind that level, there's really not a lot going on. So perhaps we're the only people that can see this order because right now, nobody else is front running that order. Anyway, we move down a couple of ticks and what happens? They've gone, they've disappeared, they've got out of the way. So we can see they've pulled and if we look at this middle one, middle dome here, we can see there's now 33 contracts at 43.20. Okay, we've disappeared. As we trade through that area, just gonna let the slide catch up here. Okay, what we can see, just 32 contracts traded at 43.20. So it was fake. And if you'd been wowed by all that size and bought ahead of that order, you would now be in a losing trade and the market's just ignoring it. But let's look at another example because like I say, it's nuanced. So here we've got 132 contract bid at 43.13 and this was actually just after we traded through this level. Okay, so somebody who'd front run the 530 would be basically licking their wounds right now. But we've got another large order below. So is that one fake or is that one real? So we see 132 contracts bid. Now if we look above that, we've got 35, 32 contracts bid at the two prices above. Now in the second image, the bids ahead of 43.13 have grown. So we've now got 76 and 60 contracts. So we can see the 4313 bid has now grown as well, so we're up to 147 contracts. So what does that mean exactly? Well, it means other traders are trading ahead of that large bid. So we do have evidence that other people are front running that order, or rather it appears that they are front running their order, because obviously nothing in trading is an absolute certainty, okay? We can say, there's other front runners there. We don't know 100% for sure, but it, that's what it looks like. Then the third image, we've got a bit more confirmation. We can see that 50 and 55 contracts traded in into 43.16 and 43.15 respectively. We're now 27th in the queue and 22 contracts have traded at 43.14. So we're one tick above where that large bid was. And again, it's grown a little bit more. It hasn't pulled out of the way. In the next image, we can see that we traded through enterprise one tick. They actually traded 87 contracts into 43.13 and the 69 left. So it's obvious at this point those large bids were real. And if we look down, there are actually some more fairly decent side bids below us too. So from a trade management perspective, we have time to make a decision. We've got something to lean on. Okay, so if we look in the center uh, slide here, I've sent a picture here. As we move up, what can we see? We can see the market's moved up away from 43.13. What we can also see is we've got some large bidders following the market up too. So we've got these 147 and 149 contracts below the market. So not a bad thing to see in that situation. So like all trading, 
front running is nuanced. It is a skill. So it just takes experience on the specific markets to, to do it. You can't just say there's a big bid, I'm going to go in front of it. Okay, it's not a one-line set of rules. It's basically like reading a story. So the front run is going to give you a scalp. It's going to give you a bounce. It is no guarantee that the market will continue forever. So again, I'll repeat, scalpers are not intentionally leaving money on the table. You're basically getting in and out of the market and taking advantage of short-term opportunities. Now, of course, the market could move up from here. If you look at it from a value traders perspective we can see the value area here we just bought below the value area um, that really wouldn't make any difference to a scalper so you can use this entry as part of your longer term strategy or you can just take the bounce get out which is effectively what a scalper would do and the next trade we're going to look at is something called a mid leg scalp and this is an interesting one because as traders we have a tendency to spend a lot of time watching the market move down so that we can buy it and then as the market's moving up we're kind of waiting for a selling opportunity so we're trying to catch the tops and bottoms of moves now obviously other traders are looking for pullbacks but you know, quite often there never is a pullback but do we ever stop to think about all the trades that occur in these legs down or in these swings down so look at this chart for most of the time it was going down and as that was happening there were traders selling you all the way down they weren't selling just the high or the low. They weren't selling a pullback. They were selling right in the middle of the move. And obviously, a lot of the time, what they were selling was the low of the day. Now, a lot of traders don't really see opportunities in the middle of a move because they focus on charts. And those charts don't define mid-move opportunities very well. In fact, they don't actually show the turns that well until they're over. But there's a lot of prop traders that will be adding to their positions in a move down like this, scaling to larger and larger positions as price moves down, which is how a lot of traders get their biggest paydays. So it's not so much being right from a single entry point, but from adding to the positions as they're proven right. And many retail traders will either take the reversal, the pullback trade, or sit on their hands in the middle because they feel basically they've missed the opportunity. And partly that's because there's a feeling that their stop has to be the other side of something visual on the chart and partly because they just don't know where to enter. So anyway, let's get back to Urex. What we can see here is the Bund here overall is moving up and the Euro stocks is moving down. Both are basically taking a breather but not really what you'd call um, a large pullback. Now I would actually prefer to use an example here where the stocks wasn't back ticking that much at all but basically when you prepare for a presentation like this you're sitting at your screen you're recording you're trading you haven't really got much choice about what the market throws at you so this is what presented itself so what we have effectively we've got a pause in the action which may or may not include the market ticking back but the thing is although I want to trade the euro stocks short it is not the action in the euro stocks that I am mostly interested in it's everything else that's going on so let's just look left to right we can see that the bobble is trading into the offer now on a thick market like this okay let's so just just explain what I mean by that I've got 161 contracts trading into the bid 1000 trading into the offer so it's obviously weighted to the offer side now when we look at correlated markets when you're looking at a very thick market that trading on one side is as good as a thinner market ticking up. So when you look at a really thick correlated or inversely correlated market, it doesn't have to be moving. But if it's trading heavily on one side, that's basically the confirmation. It's as good as a thinner market moving in that direction. We can see the Bund is actually starting to tick up. Not a great deal, but it does appear to be continuing its march up. And on the far right, we have the DAX. Uh, we all know how volatile the DAX is. You know, we can see it's putting a very nice run down. And then finally, we've got the stocks. Now, once again, I told you I don't like thicker markets. Uh, I missed the first attempt to short at 22. And basically decided to hit into the bids at 29.21 because the pace of the selling uh, was really, really speeding up at this point in time. So basically, they started this 505. That just started to come in. The bids are getting really low. I've got 76 bids. 
and I felt basically the market was about to break. So I effectively hit into the market, doing something that a lot of traders call uh, getting in the getting the edge or trying to get the edge, which is basically hitting into a level just before it breaks. So now, now again, I'm also doing this before cancelling the order at 29.22, and that's just a a timing thing more than anything else. So I've got zero expectation at this point that this order here is going to fill. Okay, I've got very high expectations that the bids are going to break, so I get my position on before I cancel the other order. So overall, I think we're in a good leg down. The market has paused a bit, and now it looks to be set to resume. So to recap, you really don't need to wait for a pullback, just a pause or an iceberg order, which is giving you some sort of backstop, a decision point, okay? So you take that pause point as basically a point where if you go the other side of it, you need to get out of the trade. So as long as the other markets are supporting your trade, you're good to go. But remember, this is going to give you a bounce. It's a scalp. But it is one where there's a decent amount of short-time momentum. Okay, so as we proceed, what do we get? We get into the trade. We can see the bobble is mostly trading into the bid. The bund hasn't actually moved forward much. The DAX on the right is down. It doesn't look like it's down because you know it's moved so much the dome has recentered. And of course the, the stocks obviously is broken down. Now as we move down, um, we can see you know the bund uh, and the bobble still not cooperating. And actually, the DAX is now starting to tick up. And in addition, we've now traded 2,681 contracts into 29.15, and the stocks hasn't moved on that volume. We actually stay in the trade, which actually probably isn't the best uh, option there for a scalper. And what we can see, the bobble is now trading primarily into the bid. The bund is heading down. DAX is heading up. I've actually reset this meter here just to give you a, a, an idea of the balance of trade. Uh, we can see we've got 6,600 cells. Dum, 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 dum. Does sound go? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so can you just give me a why? Has the sound gone? No, just I, I can hear you. Sound. Okay, good, good, good. Sorry, I just got a message. Right. Okay. So, effectively this trade is over okay so the signs we like to see to get into a trade in terms of other markets cooperating are exactly the same things we use to manage a trade okay now take a look at the five minute chart on the left for a second there's really not any significant pullbacks here but there would be mid leg opportunities to enter all the way down it's just really a matter of waiting for all the markets to be to cooperate be cooperative and for you to get some sort of pause. Now a lot of longer term day traders would benefit from watching the middle of moves for opportunities like this and because after all you are sitting in front of the screens anyway. So if you're going to be sitting in front of a screen watching the market moves it's not really that much extra work to start looking at the market in the middle of moves and actually trying to figure out is there some opportunity there. Now the next one we're going to look at is scalping volatility. Now we've all watched markets wiggle around. There isn't a market out there that just goes in a straight line. And obviously some markets are a lot more volatile than others. So DAX, crude, gold, natural gas, all very volatile instruments. Now many traders see this as something that works against them. Okay? Because basically we often get in and become kind of a victim to that volatility. Um, you know, it's really hard to get precise entries on longer term day trades on a market that moves around so much like the DAX. So you have to put up with a lot more heat on a volatile market. But the thing is, the volatility actually does represent some opportunity. After all, it is something that's quite predictable. I mean, you would not expect crude oil to march down a tick at a time and only pull back a maximum of one or two ticks on the way down. That would be extremely exceptional behavior. So any reasonable reasonably predictable market behavior can be taken advantage of and volatility is no different. So what we're going to look at is taking advantage of a counter trend spike in an intraday trend. 
although you can trade volatility in range bound markets too, but we just can't cover every technique in one session. Now, if you trade this way well, you will end up missing a lot of trades. You will end up putting in a lot of bids and offers, and the market will move away without filling them, and that is just the nature of scalping in general. So what do we have here? We have the stocks moving down. We have the bond and the bobble moving up. Now, this has literally just been recentered, but the bond... Uh, the bubble, uh, the bond here, bond here is moving up. Now I'm no expert in the DAX, and this took me quite a few attempts to actually put in an offer that got filled. But basically, the indices are on the way down. So uh, as I started, I started following this move down. I was basically putting these these offers uh, too far away from the market. So what I've got here, I've got an offer ten ticks away from the market, and once again, it's just a matter of experience where you actually place these bids and offers and when you cancel them because it's no longer feels safe. But the fact is overall, right here, right now, the stocks and the DAX are pushing down, the bubble and the bund are pushing up. I'm not that bothered about what they were doing an hour ago. I'm not that bothered about what they were doing in 20 minutes time. It's just that right now, if the DAX spikes up and the related markets still support the indices continuing down, I have an opportunity. Now, I did end up moving my offer up a tick uh, market spiked up and I got a fill at 207 and the market went through me a few ticks. Now, notice again, I've got no stop in the market. I could put in a, a safety stop way above, but as I said earlier, if you know your markets and you know that the other markets are cooperating, you're not going to go into a blind packet panic because an extremely volatile market swept you into a trade and slid past you a few ticks. Plus, we've actually only traded as high as 208. It's just that right now the spread has widened. There's actually no buyers up there. Now, if you look at the trading on the way up, you can see, it's, you know, with the exception of 200, uh, it's mostly ones and twos, uh, which is basically that's how many contracts it took to get through those levels. It's also slightly one-sided, which is to be expected on the DAX if it's moving up just one contract. So it was basically a spike up on pretty low volume. On the way down, we, we start to see uh, some of that one-sidedness. The bottom line was, market was moving down. The related markets didn't give us a reason to not take the trade. We put in an offer far away from the market enough to allow us to get swept in in the off chance of a spike, and we did get a spike. The other markets weren't indicating reversal on the indices, so we stayed with the trade. Now, that actually took me six attempts over the space of an hour before managing to get a fill. I'm not saying that would be normal, um, I'm just not comfortable trading the DAX, and so I was kind of erring on the side of caution and put my bids and offers way too far from the market, which actually brings us to another point. How do you actually go about practicing techniques like this when getting filled at the bid and offer is such a key element to these strategies? Well, you can't trade a SIM account on most platforms platforms, sorry, because the fills aren't realistic. It just won't work the same way in real time. But the good news is that some providers, for example, CQG, do actually provide realistic simulated fills on their demo accounts. Now, that is generally done at the broker end on the CQG side, not something the platform itself can do. Okay, So it's well worth looking and well worth finding out whether your uh, provider can actually give you a, a demo account that gives you realistic fills. If you can't, you're really wasting your time practicing this. On, on a, you, you know, Ninja Trader Sim 101 will not cut it. You will not have the same experience live trading uh, as sim trading. Now, of course, there are many more scalping techniques, and the ones you've seen today are all types of market making techniques. Now, they probably seem like quite unnatural trades to take to most chart traders, and I specifically chose examples that many chart traders would think, man, I'm, I wouldn't buy there, or I wouldn't sell there. And that's quite true if you plan to hold the trade for any length of time. But the game totally changes when you're just looking to capture the spread or a small pop. Now, I've given you some idea of what scalping involves, and it's very much trading in the moment that your bias can change minute to minute, that a lot of the elements we use to make a trading decision for longer term day trading are just not relevant. So, for example, if I do, if I'm when I'm trading the the S&P 500, I, I I'm not a scalper. I'm not a big fan of scalping myself. I'm not. Um, I like to kind of just sit there and, and wait for a good opportunity. And I use swing charts. I use cumulative delta for longer term trading. 
but for scalping, there's just no point in using them. In fact, they would most likely hurt you more than help you. Now, this webinar would not be complete without mentioning two distinct philosophies I've observed or I've heard from successful scalpers when it comes to around trading around size. Now, by size, we're talking about two things. We're talking about times when a lot of large orders are coming into the market, and we're also talking about areas where we're stuck and trading a lot of size. So there's two distinct philosophies. The first one is to stay away from those areas because you can't take on the large traders. You don't know what it is they're doing, and it could go against you badly. So you're better off trading against retail traders at quiet times. The second philosophy, which is just as valid, is that these areas give you a lot of liquidity to get in and out. So for areas where we're stuck trading a lot of size, it's first often quite predictable where it's going to happen. And the fact that it stays there for a long time is what gives you the opportunity to capture the spread. So on the one hand, you could be playing a game of making a market when things are relatively quiet and, and the, the action is moderate. Or you could be waiting for the market to get crowded so you can take advantage of the specific action that takes place at that time. So the fact is the market is often going to rotate around a major level in the short term regardless of whether it holds or not. And that can give you opportunity to throw a little more size at the market while that area is being resolved. Now both philosophies are absolutely correct. But this is something to consider that we haven't mentioned yet. The amount of participation is going to change through the day. And depending on the techniques you're using, you may need to stand aside when participation changes. Okay? Now, what I'd like to do as we go into the close and as you, we, you start to type in questions, uh, I'd like to give some credit here to John Grady at No BS Day Trading, who's also going to be doing a webinar here soon. Uh, RG at Discovery Trading, Gary Norden at Organic Financial, and Guy Bauer at Bauer Post. Guy Bauer, there's some YouTube videos here. He used to be the, the uh, educator at the Prop Shop PropEx. Um, these four guys have had a profound impact on my understanding of scalping. Now, scalping is not for everyone, um, but it is, of course, good to know who is on the other side of your trade. And the best way to, to you know, not only have an understanding of what it is, but actually get your hands dirty and, and actually give it a go. You know, go and get yourself a CQG demo account. Spend a few weeks doing this. It will really help your trading, even if you're a longer-term trader. Um, you know, it's my opinion that everybody should understand scalping to some extent, you know, regardless of whether you, you try it or not. Now, for the matching algorithms, I'll put this, um, oh no, sorry, let me just get the link. Uh, this link here, this progressivepowersteam.net, that is a video on the scalping, web, uh, scalping algorithms, or uh, matching algorithms, sorry. Uh, that's a webinar from the CME, absolutely fantastic webinar. You should, every trader should understand this, okay? And they break down the different matching algorithms in layman's terms, really, really worth watching. Now, as for the software you've seen today, obviously, in the screenshots, all of the software you've seen is from Jigsaw Trading, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, if you do go to the Jigsaw site, there is a lot more free educational material on there. Um, tools are all available on a risk-free trial basis. Uh, we do have a large community of traders, a lot of them with blogs on uh, Futures.io, uh, YouTube channels, as well as our own free chat room. Uh, so feel free to come along to that. So for now, we're pretty basically done on scalping. So um, Terry, can we go any, over any questions we've got? Yes, one second, working through them. Okay, let's see. Okay, they asked, do you use do you use cumulative delta in any way in your decision making for entry or exit? In terms of scalping, no, not at all. Because basically it is literally right here, right now, everything's pushing up. Um, I get into a trade, get out of a trade. It's literally it's literally some of these trades, you know, you could look at your average trade time uh, after a day of scalping, you could find your average trade time was like 15 seconds. So definitely not, no, no cumulative delta. Okay. For scalping, do you need a high-end expensive setup? I'm assuming they're talking about a computer. Um, 
You need a di your your internet connection is key. Uh, latency is key. Um, if you're too far from the market, I mean, saying that if you if you've got a thicker market, you can be further away. Um, but certainly, I wouldn't want to have a platform that's got much lag. Um, but again, you, you you're probably going to only have three or four domes up, um, and, and that's it. You're not going to have a hundred charts up. You're going to have a bunch of domes, so it shouldn't really be that heavy. But your your connectivity is key. You don't want to have an internet connection that's going down, and you want to make sure that your latency is really cut to minimum. Okay. Do you think that yield charts can help with scalps on the bonds? Um, absolutely. I, the, the guys I know that scalp the bonds tend to use that stuff um, before, as the day opens. So, you know, one of the things with the, the crowded and non-crowded philosophy is they want to take a note of uh, key levels to kind of either avoid them or play them. Um, so the, the bond scalpers that I know are using that stuff before the day opens, but not intraday. Now, of course, uh, there's, I don't know every scalper, but the ones I know, I know aren't using charts intraday at all. Okay. Uh... Are thin markets easier to get in and out of? I'm thinking quicker to get in front of the queue. It is, in fact, in fact, with a thin market, it's, it's sometimes it's not just about getting to the front of the queue. So if you if you are scalping crude, for instance, you can actually put your uh, your bids and offers away further away from the market. So not only can you get to the queue faster, but like you can take advantage of that volatility by, you know, even on a even on a trade where you're not kind of waiting for a spike, you can still put your bid uh, two or three ticks below the market. Uh, on crude, because it's a very, very good chance the way it moves that you'll get a fill. So they are, you know, they are certainly good markets in terms of getting a fill. Um, but you've really got to keep your eye. I mean, what, one of the downsides I've got to say, one of the downsides of crude is it's not the best market for correlated markets. Okay, there's, you know, natural gas, yes, currencies, you know, the, the dollar index, yes, sometimes. But you're going to find, like, if you're looking at like the indices, the uh, some of the agricultures, uh, treasuries. The correlations are much um, much more reliable than any any market correlated to crude. Okay. Can you comment on brokers that are best collate co-located for latency concerns? Um, to be honest, most of the but the thing is with the brokers, it's not so much the broker; it's the the back end they use. So you know. Um, in terms of back ends, um, I'm talking about things like CQG, TT, Rhythmic. So basically what will happen is your broker will basically um, give you one of those back ends. It's that back end that, that really works. So, so the broker, with, you know, with CQG and Rhythmic and people like that, what we see is we see the, the data feed. What we don't see is like on Rhythmic, they've got a whole suite of products for uh, risk analysis, which sits on your broker side. So your broker is effectively... Um, not really relevant when it comes to latency because your trades, um, your trades aren't really going to your broker first. Effectively, there's there's a risk analysis, there's a, you know there's a risk management layer, um, so it shouldn't really make that much difference. Okay. Let's see. Uh, you have mentioned before that market replay for learning a trade isn't great because it doesn't show the smoothness of the real market. Mm -hmm. What about using the market replay to get a feel of patterns? That are not time sensitive, at least, or at least just reviewing the day. Well, for, from a scalping perspective, there's not really uh, there's not really that many times a day where you can't find scalp trades. So I wouldn't. I mean, you you can use uh, replay to yeah look review the action, and you know a lot of people you know there is there is some merit to using replay on high speed to actually go and look at the day's action. But it's really not going to help you in terms of uh, these trades where you're just trying to capture the spread, you know, because the, the fill's not realistic, um, you know, at all, basically. Um, but I think you'll find if you look, if you start to look at scalping short-term trading, it's a really interesting thing to do. Um, that you'll find there's always opportunity on the table. Okay.
Okay, is there a market or a grouping of markets you would suggest for starting suggest with for starting the scalp? Um, yeah, I'd say um, time of day uh, comes into it. I think Urex. I, they put a U.S. is really good. Pre yeah, U.S. morning pre-open certainly um, the indices, um, the indices and the treasuries. Um, you know, you, you've got a few, quite a few choices there. Uh, some of the agricultures aren't bad markets either. Uh, move quite well, but what you've got to be really careful with the agricultural markets is on the matching algorithms because a lot of those aren't first in, first out. But you know, basically, you know, from you know six. I, well, basically, some of the markets I've shown you, some of the trades I took, I took 4 a.m in the morning on US markets. So if you look at the treasuries, for instance, the interest rate products, there's people from Australia, all over Asia, all over Europe trading those markets, you know, right from the Asian open. So the US treasuries, the indices are good markets, but like, I wouldn't scalp the ES um, particularly. I, that, that's quite a tough market. Um, but you know, that, that group of markets for sure. Okay. Given that the market is more active during the open and the close, is it better to scalp during these times? Well, the, the open, I would say, no, not at all. I wouldn't, I wouldn't scalp the You really want an orderly market to scalp. You know, you, you're making the market. You don't really want that kind of um, frenetic activity. You, want, you know, you want the market to kind of sit in a place and trade. You don't want it all over the place. So I'd say the open is not a good time. But the close is a little bit more interesting because as you get into the close, we can we can tend to just stick at a price and just keep trading. So I'd say yeah, the, the close is better. But you know, the best times you know are sometimes you know like 10 a.m., 11 a.m., like you said, uh, 8 a.m. Eastern, you know, before the markets open. Lunchtime when there's not a lot going on, the scalping opportunities. But when the market gets a bit too wild. Um, I, I would stay away. I think it's the, the you know it would be kind of a, a specialist scalp, and it would be certainly there would, there's no techniques I know for when a market's really just zooming all over the place. Okay, that kind of bunny tells us the next question they're asking about scalping at news releases, or is it best to avoid them because of volatility? I know prop traders that trade news releases, but they're not scalping. They're looking for much bigger trades, so I would not scalp anywhere near news because basically the, the liquidity just reduces and the markets tend to go all over the place and you know because the liquidity reduces to such a huge extent you won't see the correlated markets moving together so much they're actually moving because of a lack of liquidity more than um, more than the amount of trading that's going on okay do you know uh, many scalpers who back test their strategies um, I don't know how it's possible to, because you know, I, I mean, one of the things about scalping is, you know, when I when I first did this, Gary, there's a guy called Gary Norden who who kind of took me through a whole bunch of scalping techniques, and um, the first two days I tried, I took 32 trades. I scratched a, I scratched way too many trades. I scratched something like 30% um, of my trades, but I only had three losers. Okay, and that was on the that was on the first two days. There's no real need to back test because it's not really back testable. It's not like you can write a strategy to do it. Um, and you know, basically, if you're going to give it a try, get a demo account, or you know, if you've got a large enough account, you can do it with, you know with small size. Um, there's no real need to back test. You do, you can just you know within a week, within a couple of weeks, you'll have you'll have made so many trades that you'll have the stats to then decide whether you want to go from demo to live. Okay, perfect. Uh, for exits, are you strictly using limit orders or do you also use uh, market orders? Uh, yeah, well, market order, if, if I'm scratching a trade, absolutely a market order. Um, you know, if, if the market start, you know, if I'm in a long and the market starts to mar march down, I, I, I really want to get out. Um, sometimes it'll tick against me and I'll work an exit on the limit side, but you know that can that can bite you sometimes. Um, but you most of the time, if it's um, if if the trade's on my side, absolutely, it's uh, always out with the limit order, limit in, limit out most of the time. Okay, I know you touched on it a little bit before, and there's a couple of questions referring to what do you believe is the uh, best demo for scalping? I believe uh, it's CQG. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, to be honest, I don't know. I, you know, it's probably a bit fair to TT with Mix. I don't actually know. Um, I've not used those, but I've, I've, I've used CQG Demo and pointed people towards CQG Demo. And uh, it was just because CQG Demo was advice to me um, as, as the one that's got the kind of the most realistic fills. But again, I haven't tested the others, but um, it wouldn't be a use thing to test it. So I don't want to kind of um, cast the others in a bad light, so to speak. Okay. Uh, would you consider consider anything like the scalping that you've been explaining as feasible for Forex since there is no DOM? Um, not really, no. Not at all. Okay. And then there's another question about your opinion of uh, scalping Forex. Yeah, again, it's, well, to be honest, it's, uh, you know, I, can't, I can't write it off, but based on what I know, I, couldn't, I wouldn't be able to figure it out myself. Um, because I'm kind of leaning on certain things, and I guess you know, if you're used to leaning on some, it's like having stabilizers on a bicycle, right? If, when you take them off, uh, I'd be a bit worried about falling over. So that's that, you know, it's effectively it does. I can't say that absolutely it's impossible. You know, just it's just not something I'd try myself. Is there a related market to any futures type, for example, coffee or, or OJ, and if not, how would you scalp those? Well, I would look at other agriculturals, because you find that things like the metals uh, tend to move together. So, you know, you've got to look at the, um, the other agricultural products um, and then look at the, um, the currencies as well, because obviously, you know, currency is going to affect, especially coffee, currency is going to affect it. Um, but it's, it's, literally, it's literally a matter of, right, I'm going to start looking at this market and then I'm going to pull up what makes sense in terms of correlated markets and see which ones are working best and then narrowing it down that way. And, um, and that's generally what people do when they're choosing their markets to scale. Okay. Uh, how do iceberg orders and spoofing, etc., impact your various trading techniques? Well, obviously, if you see an iceberg, it's giving you that, back, that backstop. So, you know, if I see an iceberg on the bid, um, I've potentially got a long trade. I mean, one of the problems with our iceberg, especially in a thick market, is it is a really good um, indication that the market's going to potentially tick up. The problem is you might not get in because there is an iceberg order there and there's a, you know, there's a lot of liquidity in front of you. So it is a good backstop. But only, so you've got an iceberg on your market, but if the other markets aren't moving up or your correlated markets aren't moving up, when you see that iceberg, you haven't got a trade basically. So if you know if you had a, an iceberg on the bid and then you've got three of the correlated markets that are all tanking, then you don't have a trade on. Okay. Of all the US Treasury markets, are there any that always lead and always lag as far as correlation? The, I, I, no, there's, I don't think anywhere there's a market that always leads or always lags because obviously if that happens, um, arbitrage traders, HFTs, would come in and take advantage of that and that would effectively arbitrage away the opportunity. I mean, the, the thinner markets often appear to lead, but it's just because they're thinner. So, like, you know, you might see the, like we said, the two-year, if the two years trading into the offer, basically, then you'd expect the bun to be ticking up. But that doesn't really mean that the bun's leading. It just means that it, it's effectively the... The two-year trading into the offer, trading 5,000 contracts into the offer, is the same thing as the bun moving up five ticks. It's just the same action. So you have to be a bit careful. But if there was ever a, if there was ever a clear leader 100% of the time, that opportunity would be arbitraged away. It would, the arbitrage trades would be all over it. So um, it would kind of, it would, it would narrow very quickly. Okay. Uh, do. Footprint charts give any kind of edge in scalping? I would say, again, I would say no because you're literally trading, what are these markets doing right now? You, you, you don't care about the history. You, you don't care about the history. It's literally, you have to, all of this stuff about looking at charts and looking at footprints and looking at history, it's irrelevant. You're actually just trading right now, just trying to trade right now. So for me, no, maybe for somebody else, yes. Um, you know, there's, uh, the, you know, I'm trying to stick to more traditional scalping techniques. 
here on, in this presentation. I'm sure there are people who can scalp around the footprint, um, but you know, for this kind of this kind of scalp we're talking about today, no, there's, there'll be no point. It's like literally, you're trading now. You're not trading any sort of history at all. Okay. Can you explain a little bit about the fill rates and which markets are best for instant fills? Oh well, um, instant fills are probably not a great thing. Um, you, you're gonna you're gonna miss you know possibly possibly twenty thirty percent of your trades you might miss um, certainly on a thicker market, um, but you know thinner markets will obviously give you better fills and uh, thicker markets like you know if you're, if you're trading euro stocks you're going to miss um, a lot more trades basically so I can't really give you specific rates I mean it also depends on how good you are and how fast you are and uh, how much uh, how much risk you take if you're taking a little bit more risk you're going to get better fills um, but instant fills aren't always a good thing you know if you put if you put you know if there's, if there's 2,000 bid and you put a bid in and you get filled instantly because they all disappear um, you're probably in a bad trade. Okay. Let's see. Is one exchange or another better at offering an environment for scalping? Well, I'd say not particularly the exchange. I, or, you know, not that I know, but certainly the different markets have different matching algorithms, and that certainly affects how good they are for scalping. Okay. Would you recommend that a brand new beginner who has very little experience with any sort of trading begin by learning scalping in this way? Absolutely. I would say if you if you started to look at this first, but still kept an eye on the longer term picture, that's the best way to go. So I know a lot of prop traders, and they start off. You know, they they like prop firms tend to like people who've got no experience trading because they've got no bad habits to work out, and they'll start them off scalping. And um, but you talk to the longer you talk to the prop traders who've been there five or six years, and they are doing more longer term trading. So it's just basically one's a natural progression to the other. But absolutely, I would think if 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 new traders knew about these techniques and focused on them, I think they'd have a lot more success because they're not trade. You know, one of the things about a new trader, you try to tr you, you know you might pick up a technique, and it's a technique that needs a lot of experience. It doesn't work in two weeks, so you move on to the next one. And you kind of don't get the, you don't give a technique a, a enough chance, basically. So, absolutely. Okay. Can you take these types of trades with a normal broker, or do you need the need to buy a seat on the exchange? Um, you don't need to buy a seat. I mean, like like I say, if you if you trade the ultra bond, the 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 commissions are uh, low enough to make uh, money for it on retail commissions. There are some programs for the CME that, that kind of aren't a seat on the exchange. So there's one called IIP, which is if you're not in the US, it's the International Incentive Program. And if you're not a US trader, I think it's like, I can't remember the exact pricing, so $3,000 a year, and it knocks 66 cents off the CME fees. So it's not, the, the seat is not the only way to get discounts off the CME. So they do have other programs, but uh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely use the discount broker. Um, no problem at all. Okay. Does volume profile help in defining areas where you, where to scout? Yeah. Well, again, I would say scalp it. You know, scalping in the examples I've shown you. No, not at all. Uh, you can. You can. I mean, obviously, you can. Um, you can you, you can add anything onto this, right? You can add volume profile, you can add footprint charts, you can add cumulative delta, you can add charts, but then you're moving away from scalping, okay? So with a scalp, you don't really care where you are that much. You don't care whether you're in the middle of the volume profile or the extreme of the volume profile or whatever. You just care about what what the markets are doing right now, and you're literally in and out, 20, 30 seconds in and out of a trade. So you have to kind of say, you have to kind of wipe all of that kind of medium long term analysis from your head and think I'm just trading right in this moment what's happening here and now. 
Okay. Uh, this person says they listened to your TST presentation yesterday and the JS services today. Is he correct to deduce that you are in the process of building your own trading platform? That is a correct assumption, and there's going to be a webinar next month where we show that. It's just it's basically just an execution platform. Okay. They were asking if you needed beta testers or if there's going to be a beta that they could join. Yeah, there is. I mean, we're trying to get it kicked off um, next week. I've just, I've just gone through the rather laborious process of uh, getting uh, CQG demo accounts set up for the beta testers to use. Um, so yeah, that's going to be, you know, out in the ne in the next week or so, basically. Okay. Can you explain a bit more about the black horizontal line? Yeah, I mean, if you look at uh, XTrader, you see a horizontal line. It's just basically the center line, and so what you can do, you click a button, it recenters your dome, and then it puts this big black thick line across the center, and it's just used so you can eyeball where all of your related markets have moved in relation to that line since you did the reset. And it's just it's just a, a very 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 simple thing, but it is really really effective. Okay. Do H HFTs or prop shops? get to see a different dome than a retail trader? Uh, well, yeah, if you're using uh, Ninja, they might be using CQG Dome or Cunningham or XTrader, but you're seeing the same information um, or you're seeing the same bids and offers. Obviously, um, you know, XTrader Dome is um, much better than, than Ninja Dome, and obviously I think Jigsaw Dome is better than XTrader Dome, but I'm kind of biased there. But yeah, there are some you know professional platforms do have a little bit more information on there, but it's not like it's not like they're seeing a different amount of bids and offers or seeing things before you. Okay. Uh, is there a demo of Jigsaw available? No, we don't. We we do a money back guarantee basically, which is basically if you don't like it for any reason in 14 days, you get your money back. Uh, we do that mostly because we actually spend a lot of time with people when they buy the product, so we prefer to do that if they've actually put something on the line. Do you think that gold and natural gas are good for scalping? Um, I think so, yeah. I think they're good markets for scalping because they, they move around a lot. And um, But again, just avoid them at um, peak times. I mean, gold's good because gold's got better correlations than, than natural gas. Um, I mean, if you look at the energies, if you look at the energies, you know, you've got the the natural gas, the crude, um, you've got the breakdown products, but a lot of them are very thinly traded. Um, you know, so it's probably not not as good as the as the metals, in my opinion, in terms of correlations. Okay. Uh, where can we learn on how to find correlated markets? Uh, you mentioned alg agriculture is related to currencies. Is there any book or website that you can recommend? I don't know. I mean, if you Google correlated markets, you should find plenty. I mean. Um, I think I think Anthony Drager did a, a webinar on correlated markets on Futures IO recently. Um, it's it's a pretty common subject. It's a pretty common subject. So uh, I haven't looked myself, but it's a fairly common subject. I'm sure I'm sure there's stuff out there. I mean, it's not that it's not it's not that difficult. Um, you know, you can you can just pull up the markets and see what moves together. But it's it's mostly common sense. You know, oil oil does have a relationship to currencies because if the dollar goes down. It's going to affect the oil prices. Um, you know, interest rate products will move together. Uh, in, you know, stock indexes will move together. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's stuff online about it. Okay. Also, uh, uh, to be honest, it, go on. So it, uh, the, the answer to that question, probably the best answer to that question, is start a thread on Futures IO, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure you'll get a lot of information on it. Yeah, I was going to say something to that effect. Also. Um, yeah. November first, Anthony Drager will be back for a part two on co correlated markets. So, let's see. Uh, can you please explain again how to identify a thick or thin areas on the DOM where to scalp? Yeah, basically, it's just it's just really about the the relative size uh, on the DOM itself. So. You know, a thick do you know, a thick market would be like the ES right now has got thousands, you know, it's, it's averaging over a thousand per level on the dome. 
Um, you know, you might look at crude oil, which is an average of maybe 50 or 60 on the dome, and then you, know, you might see 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 500, and that 500 is a thick area on the dome. So what they tend to do is they're putting, you know, a lot of these orders are real, a lot of them are spoof. You tend to see the spoof orders, they kind of go a little bit over the top in terms of getting recognized, you know. So when there's a spoof order out there, it's, it's very, very obvious. They don't, you don't see, if you've got an average of 1,000 at a level, they don't spoof 1,100, they'll spoof 3,000. So, so that's basically what you're looking for. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to say this is the last question here. Uh, would it be wise to use the corral function on a trading platform? Corral, I don't know what the corral function is. Uh, I'm going to give him a second to see if he responds. It says corral on two different instruments. Oh, you mean spread trading? Um, if you mean spread trading, absolutely. There's there's a lot of prop shops um, that encourage spread trading, although <laughs> it's kind of a bit, a bit of unfair to don't don't see all prop shops in the in this in a bad light. But some prop shops are more interested in their traders generating commissions than actually making a profit. In fact, they don't care if the traders breaking even as long as they generate commissions. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with spread trading, but um, a lot of the times when prop prop shops push the trades towards spread trading, it's kind of more about generating commissions than actually, you know, um, than making profits. Okay. Well, uh, thank you today for the webinar, Peter. As always, it's fascinating. Uh, no problem, Terry, and, and thank you, and uh, thank Mike for me. I'm sure he's sunning himself now in Ecuador, and uh, thank everybody for, for coming. All right, there's a lot of people saying thank you and uh, appreciating the webinar, so definitely uh, talk okay, to you thanks. soon. Okay, bye.